And while there, a co-ed asked him to define love. He had just given a devotional in one of the dormitories, and after his talk and the question and answer period, this young lady inquired privately, Tell me, what is love? She went on to paint the picture of a serious romance with a fellow student who was now making sexual demands that troubled her. Yet, she thought it might be love after all, and so, what should she say to her insistent boyfriend? Well, the question was an important one to her, and it had very real and very immediate implications. And the preacher then says that when he turned to a New Testament description of love, this highly intelligent college woman wanted nothing to do with it. And she hastily replied, No, that's not the kind of love I'm talking about. My preacher tried to read the same thing to me. No, you, you just don't understand. And finally, the preacher says, I got her quiet long enough to read from the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. But before I did, I asked her, Do you really believe this man loves you? Do you think that mature adult lasting love prompts his demands of you? Check Paul's description of love and see if you can answer these questions. And then he said, we went on and read, love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous, act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, endures all things. And then we got down to verse 13. But now faith, hope, love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. He then ends by saying that his college friend walked away without a word. What is this thing called love anyway? We speak of loving beans and cornbread, fried chicken and bluebell ice cream, or country music, George Strait, and so on. We say, I just love that dress, or I just love your new car. We can speak of loving strawberries, money, mother, and Christ, and go from physical appetite to good to greed to family affection to devotion to Christ without batting an eye. We use the phrases falling in love, being in love, making love. Someone has defined love as an itch you can't scratch. But what is this thing called love? A girl comes in from a date. Her eyes are shining and she says, Ah, oh, I think I'm in love. Her mother giggles and says, You're just 15 years old. You don't even know what love is. Do we know what love is? In English, we have only one word for love, which we make do to describe our preferences, our pals, our passions. But the Greek language, which is very interesting, the language in which the New Testament was written, was in many ways a more exact language than English. 
English is somewhat like Neapolitan ice cream. You see, we put off all the flavors in one box or one word. But the Greeks generally had a different word for each flavor or shade of meaning. The Greeks had four words for the thing called love. And we're going to examine these four words this morning as part of the essential background on understanding what love is. And I know you've heard this before, but we're going to go over it because it's going to build upon what I'm going to be speaking on the next few times I get to speak, Lord willing. But the first word is the word eros in Greek. Eros is the noun form. The verb form is areo. And eros was used by the Greeks to signify passion or strong feeling. It might be the passion of ambition or the passion of patriotism. Frequently, however, it was used by them to refer to physical or sexual passion. So we would define the word eros simply as physical attraction. And nothing is wrong with this particular word or this love in and of itself. Something that sex is a dirty word, but God made sex, not the devil. And God made them male and female, we read in Genesis 1 verse 27, and pronounced his creation very good in Genesis 3 verse 25. In the New Testament, Paul speaks of sex as one of the blessings within marriage, as we read, of course, in 1 Corinthians 7 verses 3 through 5. The writer of Hebrews speaks of the marriage, of the marriage bed, as that which is undefiled in Hebrews 13 verse 4. The Song of Solomon is filled with rather explicit details of physical love in the context of marriage. Apparently, this has embarrassed both Jews and Christians through the years, and, and thus scholars have attempted to make the book an allegory of God's love for his people. Speaking of the book of Solomon, or the Song of Solomon. But nothing in this book indicates that it is anything other than that which it appears to be. A beautiful story of a man's love for his wife. How many of you ever read the book of the Song of Solomon? How many of you have studied the book of the Song of Solomon? Well, when reading this book, one cannot escape the fact that in it God puts his stamp, his stamp of approval on the intimate physical relationship between husband and wife. So it's worth noting, however, that the Bible is never crude in discussing that topic. Most of the time, biblical readers use the modest word, no. Now, although God originated physical attraction and sex, it was not long until the divine ideal was sidetracked. You see, the one who corrupted Eros was Satan. It's even been his purpose to counterfeit and pervert God's arrangement. God made male and female, Satan makes male and male, female and female. God puts sex in the confines of marriage. Satan says that it makes no difference where, when, or with whom. God made physical attraction as a means to an end. Satan makes it an end within itself. 
So, as Charles Hodges says, the most private act, the ultimate secret between two people, is dragged through the alley, the gutter, and the barnyard. By the time the New Testament was written, Eris had only bad connotations. The Greek god of physical love was named Eros, corresponding to the Roman god Cupid. Y'all are familiar with Cupid, right? This little darling angel who goes flying around shooting people with the love arrow. Now, the worship of this god involved fertility rites and prostitution. That'll give you something to think about on Valentine's Day, won't it? This concept of Eris is reflected today in our word erotic, which also has only bad connotations. To the Greeks, Eris was the greatest motivating force and one of life's great goals. It involved the satisfaction of every desire. Some, such as, such as Plato, attempted to elevate Eris to a higher plane, but it always retained the basic aspect of selfishness. I want this for me. I want you for me. And I'm not that concerned about you. Probably because of these bad connotations, the word eris is not found in the Greek text of the New Testament. It is, however, found several times in the, Septu in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, that was frequently quoted by Jesus and the apostles. This is the first word for love that we want to note. Eris, physical attraction, physical love. It is not a bad word within itself, but if it is isolated from the other types of love, it can be a gross and crude perversion, a mockery of love. And then there's another word for love. And we'll look at that very briefly. It's an important word, but not so important as the others for the purpose of our lesson. This word is storge. It's the noun form, and storgeo is the verb form. This is a love or loyalty based on some close tie. In secular literature, it was used for loyalty to a ruler or a nation, or even in a pagan household idol. Since it usually referred to family ties, we can call this family love. An excellent biblical example of this kind of loyalty is found in 2 Samuel 21, verses 10 and 11, where we find Rispa standing guard over the corpses of her two sons and other kinsmen warding off buzzards by day and beasts by night. Twice it is found in negative and is translated unloving, as we read in Romans 1, verse 31, 2 Timothy 3, verse 4. The King James Version translates the negative form of this word without natural affection. In that day, this would have included such things as homosexuality, the exposure of unwanted children, and the drowning of children with defects. Today, it would include abortion. The word is found once in the positive in a compound word containing the verb form aphilia, 
This com combination is translated, be devoted, be devoted to one another. Romans 12, verse 10. That's a look at the word storge, or storgeo. The third word, one we are very familiar with, is philia. This is the noun form. The verb form is philio. A great variety of words are based on these two words. This was the most common word for love. It closely relates to the way we mostly use the word love. It has to do with affection and feeling warmly toward someone or something. It was a general word. It could be used of the affection a husband had for his wife or the affection of parents for their children. Or it could be used of the affection of one friend for another. Since this last description is a major use of the word in the New Testament, we have designate this word as friendship love. We're all familiar with what this means. If I like you and you like me, we have philia for one another. One of the great Bible examples of this kind of love is the friendship of David and Jonathan in the Old Testament. This word is used in the compound word Philadelphia, which literally means love of brother or brotherly love. It is used in philanthropy, which means love of man or love of mankind. And in Philip, which is a shortened form of philia plus hippo, which is love of horses. And in philosophy, which refers to a love of wisdom. While philia was the most commonly used word for love in New Testament times, it is not the most commonly used word in the New Testament itself. But it is still a very important word in the New Testament. Philia itself is used only once in the New Testament. In James 4 verse 4, where it is simply translated friendship. But the verb form phileo is used 25 times. 21 of those in the gospel accounts, mainly in the book of John. Usually it is translated as love, and this is the word used in John 11 verse 3, when it says Jesus loved Lazarus. Another form of the word used is phileo, which is found 29 times in the text of the New Testament and is a verbally translated friend. You know, and we know that it means to cherish and often refers to an expression of affection such as a kiss. Probably the most familiar use of phileo, however, are when it is combined with other words to form compound words. Philadelphia, brother love, is used in Hebrews 13 verse 1. Let love of the brethren continue. Phileo andros, or man, or husband lover. And philo Tickness or child lover are found in Titus 3 verse 4. Encourage the young women to love their husbands, we are told, to love their children. And the importance of philia love cannot be overemphasized. In Genesis 2 verse 18, God stated, It is not good for the man to be alone. We need friends. We need people 
of whom we are fond and who are fond of us. If we don't, then we have a problem. If we don't need people, if we don't need somebody to be fond with, there's a problem. And even Jesus needed his close circle of friends. And that is the way God made us. And then, of course, there's the last word. And you're all familiar with this. And this is the most important Greek word for love. Some translators consider this the greatest word in the human language. It's the word agape. Agape is a noun form. The verb form is agapeo. I know you're all very impressed that I can give you these Greek words, right? But sometimes it's necessary to know that there is a noun form, there is a verb form, and thus we can dictate what they mean and come to an understanding of how they're used in the scriptures and what God wants us to do with them. How can I apply this to my own life and especially to my relationship with God? And that's what this word does. And so we need to look at it. Unlike philia, this word was not used a great deal by Greek speaking people before the New Testament was written. No use at all has been found in the secular writing of that, of that day of the noun form agape as a common noun. The verb form agapeo was used to some extent but in a rather colorless way. For instance, we find that Agapeo is derived from agapme, which means to admire. And apparently this was the usual meaning of, agap of agapeo among the Greeks. But when we come to the New Testament, this is the word used in the original text for love. The noun form is found almost 120 times. The verb form is found more than 130 times. And this word is used in John 3 verse 16, the one we're so familiar with, for God so loved the world. It is used in 1 John 4 verse 8 and 16. God is love. The word is used in 1 Corinthians 13, the great love chapter of the Bible, of which we read earlier. It's used in the passages to show the supremacy and preeminence of love. Why is agape the primary word for love in the New Testament? Someone has suggested that God looked at Eris and saw that often it had more to do with passion than love. Then he looked at Storge and saw it too narrow in scope, dealing only with kinship royalty. Next he looked at Philia and found even that special word too limited. It was a beautiful word having to do with closeness and affection, but it was mainly for those near and dear. It could not take in everyone. So God decided to use agape, a word without a great deal of character, just waiting to be filled with meaning. He took it and made it the core of Christianity. We cannot know God's thought processes. But the fact is that inspired 
New Testament writers and speakers did take an obscure word and infuse it with meaning it never had before. They made it Christianity's master word, its inner secret, its outward sign, its unique mark. Agape is not an easy word to define. In an article on love, the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia includes this definitive note. Love, whether used of God or man, is an earnest and anxious desire for and an active and beneficent interest in the well-being of the one loved. Somewhere I picked up this definition that I like. Agape is love for another that is characterized by the desire to do what is best for the one loved. I don't think you can get any better than that. And that's a strong, strong love. It's not me that's important. The one that I love is more important than I. Somewhere we read about that throughout the New Testament, don't we? Do not be so concerned about your own interests, but about what? The interests of others. Agape is not totally different from the other loves we have mentioned. It is not devoid, devoid of emotion, affection, and feeling. But the New Testament speakers and writers took the natural affection and feelings of love and elevated them to a higher plane so they can also take in the unlovely and unlovables. The classic statement of this is found in Matthew 5, verse 46 through 48, or 44 through 48, where Jesus gave this challenge when he said, But I say to you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, in order that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do you not, do not even the tax gatherers do the same? And if, if you greet your brothers only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. You are to be complete. Of course, the classic illustration of this kind of love is found in the story of the Good Samaritan, Luke chapter 10, which is given to illustrate love, agapeo for a neighbor. And when the Samaritan looked at that bruised and bleeding man, there was no physical attraction, Eris. The man who had been beaten was not a beloved kinsman. The Jews and Samaritans hated each other. There was no storge love. The man in the ditch was not a friend. He had nothing to share. There was no potential for reciprocal action. Philia. What was the only possible motivation for this traveler to help him? He was a fellow human being. And the Good Samaritan said, in effect, Therefore I will help him. This is agape love. So in conclusion, and I know you all just love that word.
Let me give three quick contrasts between the four types of love we have looked at. Era says, I'm attracted to you. Storge says, I'm kin to you. Philia says, I really like you. Agape says, I love you. Eris is based on the glands. Storge is based on genetic ties. Philia is based on emotions. Agape is based on a decision, an act of the will. Eris says, I love you because I am attracted to you. Storge says, I love you because we are related to each other. Philia says, I love you because I enjoy being with you. Gape says, I love you. Not I love you if, or I love you because, but just I love you. Do not misunderstand me. All these words are important. To live life to its fullest, we need a combination of these four types of love. But agape is the basis of our relationship with God. It is the basis of a lasting, happy, and God-pleasing marriage. A happy and God-pleasing home is the secret of all lasting human relationships. The challenge for all of us is to learn to love as God wants us to love. The great example of agape love is God himself. God looked down on the earth Nothing was attractive about mankind, Eris, would not do. Mankind had denounced its relationship with God. That eliminated Storge. Neither was Philia adequate, for men were not friends with God. In actuality, as Paul says, they were God's enemies. And then we read in Romans chapter 5, verses 8 through 10. But God demonstrates His own love toward us. His own love toward us. Something different about His love toward us. God demonstrates His own love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled we shall be saved by his life. Oh, isn't that beautiful? God's own love toward us. God loves us in a special way. In that very special way. Gave his son for us while we were still his enemies. That's agape love. Don't you love a God like that? Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your love. We ask that we might be able to manifest your love 
back toward you, but also toward mankind. May we show the world what it truly means to love. More so than just being friends. Willing to give our lives for one another. Just as you did for us. Thank you. May we ever always be so grateful for your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, as God manifested this great love of which we have spoken of, and as he put his son upon the cross for each and every one of us, Jesus proclaimed that we are to be forgiven. But he based it upon the condition that he gave his disciples to go and preach. He said, go to all the nations, teaching them, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all things that I have commanded you, Lord, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. Mark said it very simply, those who believe and are baptized shall be saved, those who disbelieve shall be condemned. Peter, when asked the question, what shall we do, as they were pierced to their heart, knowing that they were guilty of putting Christ upon the cross, an innocent man, and yet he died for their sins, and as they were pierced to their heart, they wanted to know what they should do. Peter said, repent, be baptized, each one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. God loves us enough to give every man the opportunity for salvation. And if there is one here today who has not yet put Christ on in baptism, as the scriptures teach, one must do. And as Jesus told his disciples to go and proclaim in order to get into the kingdom of God, if you have not yet done that, we encourage you and we invite you to come now as we stand and as we sing.